dismissal to class, we'll sing number 541, 541. Though the way we journey may be often drear, we shall see the King someday. On that blessed morning, clouds will disappear. We shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gather round the throne when he shall call his own. We shall see the king someday. After pain and anguish, after toil and care, we shall see the king someday. Through the endless ages, joy and blessing share. We shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gather round the throne when he shall call his own. We shall see the King someday. There with all the loved ones who have gone before. We shall see the King someday. Sorrow past forever on that peaceful shore. We shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gather round the throne when he shall call his own. We shall see the King someday. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day and for your watch, guard, and care over us and for, for the, us being able to come here tonight and study another portion of thy word. We ask you to bless us and bless the teachers and help them present their lessons in a way that will be most beneficial to the students and help us to take what we learn from thy word and apply it to our lives and be better Christians. Father, we ask you to bless those that are sick and less fortunate in life than we are and Comfort them and help us to do the same. Father, we ask you to bless us in everything we do and help us to be successful. And, and Father, we ask you to watch over and care for us, forgive us of our sins, and at last save us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. My pleasure to welcome you here this evening. It's been quite an eventful day weather-wise in West Georgia. We're thankful for everyone being here and making it through the storm safely and gathering together to worship and study this evening. A few more coming in, but we're thankful for any who may be visiting with us this evening. We do have visitors among us. We invite you back anytime you can be here. We'll dismiss now with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. Middle school, high school, and adults.
do, but I may. I think, yeah, I think I'll wait. Am I coming across? No, Mike. Okay. We are we are in the midst of period number nine this evening. We'll be hopefully finishing that this period up tonight, and um, I suspect we'll get uh, on into period number ten. If we start running real low on time, we may just hold off period number ten till next time, so we can start right on that. But if we go as far as I'm thinking, we will. We should get into that. Uh, anything at all before we pick up from what we've talked about thus far from uh, really anything up to this point, periods one through nine? Questions or comments or anything? I'm going to quit asking. <laughs> um, just, just what, This is not something we're going to go over because we've already covered this, but just if you missed that, there are the events covered. Um, I do have, I have a period number eight here. I don't think I have, yeah, I do have a couple of extra period nine. Uh, we'll, assuming we get to period number 10, I'll hand that out in just a moment. But it covers death of Solomon to the destruction of the northern kingdom. This is when the kingdom is divided, of course. Uh, Samaria, capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem, capital of the southern kingdom. Important places, Dan and Bethel, where the calves were set up by Jeroboam. Those are your important places. We talked about the people in this section, 19 kings of the north. Not a one of them was righteous. First 12 kings of Judah, there will be 19 in all, unless you count Athaliah, which I don't. But if you count her, then that's 20. But she wasn't, she wasn't a monarch. She just took over the throne and managed to hang on to it for six years until the priests led an uprising. And Joash, uh, as a six-year-old boy, began to uh, be kind of... I don't know if you'd, he was the king, but we mentioned the, the high priest was ruling for him, making all the decisions until he was of age. And then prof, the prophets Elijah and Elisha, of course, are important in this period. We talked about this chart, so I'm not going to go back over that, but that's just a look. Uh, the left hand, two columns, Israel, the, the right two columns, kings of Judah. This is the, what we were talking about last week. Well, we actually got past this. Uh, this is a period of about 210 years. After Solomon dies, the, the kingdom will divide. You know, the people asked him, uh, make life easier on us and we'll, we'll serve you, we'll, we'll support you. Solomon asked the young folks, they, or he asked the older folks, and they said, well, do it, and they'll, they'll honor you and they'll, they'll follow your lead. The, the young folks said, oh, no, make it harder on them. And so that's what he decided to follow their advice. And so the kingdom splits. Northern kingdom is Israel. Ten tribes go with Jeroboam in the northern kingdom. And then the first king, of course, was Jeroboam. Uh, he set up the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. Two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, stay with the southern kingdom, and it becomes known as the kingdom of Judah. Rehoboam, of course, first king. Every one of those kings is a descendant of that same line of David. There are several lines that make up the northern kingdom, but not so in the south. Uh, this is God preserving that lineage of David, and you'll see this come up in the book of Matthew. In fact, I've just been reading um, a couple of nights ago. I was reading in, in this book about the life of Christ. And if you go to Matthew and you compare the generations with this list, uh, they, don't, they don't match up completely. And, and the reason for that is it's very obvious when you look at Matthew's list. In fact, Matthew actually basically says it in his gospel account when he begins. He says, here are 14 generations from Abraham to David and from David to um, the carrying away into captivity and from the carrying away into captivity till Jesus and so he says 14 generations 14 generations 14 generations and so he's not necessarily meaning it to be an explicit you know list because some of these uh, I'm trying to remember exactly where he skips and I can't remember now without going back to that book and looking at it but it's somewhere right around here. He skips like Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and goes to Jehoiakim or Jeconiah. Um, but anyway, the, he, there are sections where he skips a couple of generations because those generations will be so familiar to anyone with a cursory knowledge of Jewish history. And of course, Matthew's gospel account was written primarily to whom? 
to the Jews, uh, to Jewish people to present Jesus as the Christ. We sometimes talk about Jesus Christ as if Jesus is his first name and Christ is his last name. And that we understand that that's the term that kind of came to be used to refer to him. But technically, his name was Jesus, and it's, a, it's, it's kind of a variation of Jeshua, uh, Joshua, uh, even Hosea is kind of a Hebrew variation of that. All those names meaning uh, Jehovah is salvation or something to that effect. Jesus is his name. Of course, he's also called Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew mentions that in Matthew chapter 1. But Christ is his title. That's what he is. He is the Christ. Just like John the Baptist. He wasn't a Baptist as far as a member of the Baptist denomination. There was no Baptist denomination. He was John the baptizer, John the immerser. That's what he did. That was his office. And so it is with Jesus. His office is he is the Christ, uh, the Savior, the Messiah, the Anointed One. All those are synonymous terms. But uh, Matthew in his Gospel account, he's giving 14, 14, 14 generations so that it's easier to memorize for these folks. And the Jewish folks would easily recognize those one or two gaps in the genealogies of these kings. So anyway, these are, uh, these are all descendants of David. And so you'll follow that, and, and Matthew traces that lineage all the way back to Abraham from Jesus, showing, and again, Matthew writing to Jews, that's very important to know Jesus is the Christ because the Christ every Jew knew. In fact, on one occasion, Jesus asked some of the religious leaders, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? What was their immediate answer? Son of David. They knew the Christ was to be the son of David. So Matthew writing to Jews, he says, he starts off his gospel account saying, here you go. Jesus is the Christ. And I'll show you one reason right off the bat. He's the son of David. Uh, also, during this period, we mentioned last week, there are several faithful kings. Asa was faithful, Jehoshaphat, and although Jehoshaphat sometimes leaves us scratching our heads wondering what he's thinking, uh, and Hezekiah. Even Hezekiah had his moment. What was Hezekiah's one moment that uh, just sort of leaves us scratching our heads saying, you know, what are you doing, Hezekiah? In fact, he gets rebuked by the prophet Isaiah for it. Do you remember this? It's right after the account of Sennacherib attacking Jerusalem. It's right after the fall of the northern kingdom. Sennacherib, remember, turns his attention to the southern kingdom. And Sennacherib even says in his annals, or what we might call his journal or diary or however you want to put that, he basically says, I got Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. He's shut up like a bird in a cage. It's just a matter of time. And I've got, I've got this, the kingdom of Judah in my grasp. But his records end there. Well, we know if he had conquered them, his records would have bragged about his conquest because that's what those kings did. So why didn't he brag about it? Well, because it didn't happen. They don't write down their defeats. You know, he, he who wins the wars controls the history, as they say. Um, but he didn't write, well, you know, we suffered a crushing defeat. They, they just didn't do that. So why did it go silent? Well, you learn about that when you look at um, the Bible history and also other history of the time is, is backed up by secular history as well that Hezekiah in the southern kingdom of Judah never fell to Sennacherib in the kingdom of Assyria because of course as we talked I think we talked about this last week that the angel of the Lord went into the camp and killed in one night 185,000 of those Assyrians and so Sennacherib went back home and was killed by his sons as he worshipped his idol God but it was immediately after that that Hezekiah gets sick. And what does he... What, what's, what happens there? Isaiah tells Hezekiah what? He says, set your house in order. Why? Because you're going to die from this illness. And it's very interesting. In fact, Brother Moser is going to be preaching about this in our morning... I think it's our morning worship session. Uh, that's a week from this Sunday, isn't it? So, yeah, it's just, just a little over a week away. And he's going to be preaching about this section where Hezekiah is dealing with the grief of, of facing his own mortality. And, of course, he prays and asks God to, to take this away. And God says, okay, I'm going to extend your life. And, of course, he was even given a sign. What was that sign? The, the sundial went backwards. That was the sign. But, yeah, he did have 15 years. I think it was 15 years. Um, but, yeah, the sundial was the sign of this miraculous sign to show that this is going to come to pass the sundial the shadow on the sundial goes back 
15 degrees. But he recovers, and then what I was going to mention, it leaves us kind of scratching our head with Hezekiah, even in all the righteous things, the wonderful things we read about him. After he recovers, they bring, uh, they, these folks come from Babylon. I guess you'd call it kind of an ambassage from, from Babylon. They come, and Hezekiah, in fact, you may have heard pe preachers preach sermon. Uh, I've, I've heard many an old-timey preacher preach a sermon called, What Have They Seen? in thine house that's what isaiah asked to hezekiah hezekiah what have they seen in thine house hezekiah says oh man i showed them everything it seems to be a little bit of pride there kind of boasting come check out what i've got and, and see my stuff and so isaiah says to hezekiah well everything in your house is going to be seen by the king of babylon it's going to be taken it's not going to happen in your generation but it's coming and so that was one of those situations where Hezekiah was very out of character for him. But it, again, it shows us it shows us two things. Number one, this this fellow was human. He made mistakes, same as we do. Number two, it also shows us more evidence of the Bible's inspiration. And we've mentioned this before. The Bible does not try to sugarcoat its heroes to make them out to be something that they're not. You read books that are secular books that are uninspired works, and the hero is built up to be virtually sinless almost but the bible doesn't do that and that's one of those things that's it's not one of the main ways that we know the bible's inspired but it's just one of those things that helps add add something to show us that this book is not like other books it's unique and there's a reason why we call it the book because it's so unique and that's one way it doesn't try to cover up mistakes of its heroes uh we talked about all this elijah and elisha um confrontation with the prophets on uh, mount carmel that was elijah Elisha taking over for Elijah when Elijah is swept up into heaven. 720 BC, 722 B.C., rather, the northern kingdom falls, and then you've got some prophetic books connected with this period, Joel, Jonah, Amos, Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah. Some of these cover beyond this period even, such as um, Isaiah. Isaiah prophesies through the fall. In fact, he's the one that comes to Hezekiah with the message from God saying, you're going to be spared from King Sennacherib. Uh, Hosea, I can't remember. I, I'd have to look back at some notes. I think Hosea, no, 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 he's not. He's, he's not through the fall of the northern kingdom, but he's, he's right up pretty close to it. Hosea and Micah basically speak of the fall of the northern kingdom as if it is a reality. That's the reason sometimes it's easy to get confused. They speak of it as being so certain because the northern kingdom of Israel is so far gone at that point that it's not that they couldn't repent, but, but they weren't. They weren't going to repent at that point. And so God is speaking of, of the fall basically as almost as if it's an accomplished fact. We looked at this uh, last week, just a su quick summation. Northern Kingdom was 10 tribes. Samaria was the capital. 19 kings, none of them were righteous. Uh, in fact, they all worshipped the calves, the golden calves in Dan and Bethel. Eight kings either assassinated or committed suicide, so a lot of turnover and turmoil in the northern kingdom. 210-year period, 135 years less than the southern kingdom. And then really, if you just want to remember one date, 721, 722-ish B.C. is the fall. Uh, over here in the southern kingdom, you got Benjamin and Judah. Jerusalem is the capital. 20 kings, 19 really, with one usurper. Seven of them, were at least seven, were considered good in God's sight. Uh, and again, sometimes that was for a time, not, not necessarily their entire reign or life. Uh, conquered by the Babylonians somewhere around 586 B.C., 70-year captivity. And then Persia overthrows Babylon and three returns there. And we'll talk about those when we get to uh, the return from captivity. This is where we left off last week, talking about uh, some turmoil in the divided kingdom. You see a lot of war here between these two kingdoms. Uh, notice up here... The first 50 years, uh, the, the northern kingdom is harassed by Judah under Omri's house. They're, they're prosperous the next 40 years under the reign of Omri. He had a very long reign. Then the next 40 years, they're brought very low under Jehu and Jehoahaz, and they reach their greatest extent under Jeroboam II. You have anarchy, ruin, and captivity in the last 30 years of that kingdom. Jeroboam the second, by the way, is the time when Amos goes to the north and cries out against them. In fact, he says, 
Uh, let me get my reference right here. I want to say, well, I'm not going to say because I'm afraid I'm going to get it wrong. Yeah, to uh, chapter 6 of, of the book of Amos, he starts off and he says, uh, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria. He's prophesying during this highest point of their kingdom, the northern kingdom, the richest time, the greatest territorial expansion, uh, all that. Hosea also is prophesying somewhere during that time. So, you know, it's not looking at the economy. It's not looking at how is the nation doing politically. They were rotten on the inside. And God says, change this or you're going to fall. And of course, as I mentioned, by the time you get to um, Hosea, it's, it's just about an accomplished fact because it's, it's so far gone. But you see some other notes here on the southern kingdom. Their first 80 years, they were quite prosperous, growing in power. Uh, some considerable disaster and in introduction of Baalism in the next 70 years. Then you've got a 50-year period under Uzziah where they reach their greatest extent. Uh, of course, Uzziah is the one at that point when they reach their greatest uh, height of power. He, he's lifted up with pride and, and is struck with leprosy. Next 15 years under Ahaz, they become tributary to the, to the king of Assyria. So they're just basically almost like a vassal type state. Uh, they're not asking God for help. They're... They're trying to lean on Assyria and trying everything they can do to keep Assyria from coming and carrying them away into captivity, stripping gold off the temple and things like that. And then the next 30 years, you've got has, under Hezekiah, they regain their independence. It's important to note they regain their independence because Hezekiah turned to God and not some heathen king to ask for help. He says, as a nation, we're going to turn to God. They kept the Passover and things like that, the Passover in such a way that they had not kept it in years. But he says, we're going to follow God, and so they have their independence again. And then the last 100 years, they're pretty much a vassal of Assyria. And I'm, uh, I'm thinking there that I'd have to check my history, but that may, that may actually be supposed to be Babylon. Um, Babylon comes somewhere during that time period. It, it might be a little bit of both, actually, go, that, that long a time span, because there's a time when Assyria is the world power, and then Babylon later on. But basically, the last 100 years, they're not, for all intents and purposes, they're not really independent. They've got a king, but they're just, they're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, as the expression goes. They, they take gold from the temple or wherever they can get it, and they're trying to pay off people to keep them from coming and just wiping them out. They're just trying to buy off whatever king's in power. Um, Relation of the two kingdoms to each other. First 80 years, you have war between the two pretty continuously. Second 80 years, they're at peace. Um, then the last 50 years, there's basically intermittent war right up to the end. Northern kingdom. Here's, here's what I mentioned a while ago. Nine different dynasties in the northern kingdom. You've got Jeroboam, Nadab, Baasha, Elah. You see all these. I won't read all those. But you see how nine different dynasties, whereas in the southern kingdom, it's just, just one, as you see down here, David. It's the line of David. Uh, but again, 19 kings north, uh, average reign is about 11 years. So not, you know, not, not very long, really. Eight of the 19 kings died by violence. And he's got a note here about uh, Athaliah. She broke into David's line, interrupted the succession for six years. She never interrupted the succession. To interrupt the succession, you would you'd have to kill all of uh, David's descendants or, or whoever was the king before Joash. And I can't remember who that was right now, but... Uh, she didn't interrupt the line. She just usurped the throne for a period of six years. And then they, the priest rose up against her and she was killed, uh, executed. And then uh, Joash was, was put on the throne. Uh, there's an average here of about 16 years per reign. You see what I'm saying about this guy's chart? He, he, he does, he's, he's done some serious work here, even down to average length of reign per king. Um, all the kings of Israel served the calf. The worst of them served Baal. Most of the kings of Judah served idols, but a few of them served God, Jehovah. Some bad kings were partly good. Some good kings were partly bad. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this. This just show you there are a lot of prophets in here that aren't necessarily the, the famous prophets during this period. Uh, Samuel, of course, everybody recognizes. Nathan we recognize because he confronted David. Gad, you have Ahijah who deals with Solomon and Jeroboam the first over here. 
Ido, Shemiah, Azariah, Hanani, or Hanani, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that, Jehu, Jehu, on and on it goes, Micaiah, very, Micaiah is the one that Ahab said, well, I hate him because he doesn't ever say anything good about me, uh, when, when Ahab and Jeho- Jehoshaphat were forming their alliance. Then here you have uh, Elijah, we all recognize Elijah and Elisha, uh, Zechariah, and that's actually, if I'm not mistaken, that's a different Zechariah than the prophet uh, in the Minor Prophets, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think. Isaiah, of course, we all recognize Isaiah, but you just you see different ones, and he's got, and these are all on BibleCharts.org. If you want to study them further, just for time's sake, we're not going to uh, go over every little detail of them. But just interesting stuff, just to see under whose reign uh, these prophets prophesied. In fact, if you're studying this, if we were doing more than just an overview of the Old Testament, uh, I would really get deep into these charts because this would really help us if we were studying, say, the Book of Jonah or the Minor Prophets or the book of Isaiah, to go back here at Isaiah and see, okay, he's prophesying during the reign of these last couple of kings of Israel, during the reign of Uzzah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Manasseh in the southern kingdom. So it would be very helpful. But like I said, for, for our purposes, we're just kind of doing an overview. So just, just to give you an idea there, though. But some of these are, are very familiar, some of them not so much. Uh, you've got Obed, who's contemporary with Jonah. Obed, not a writing prophet. Huldah's not a writing prophet. We don't have any books from Huldah. Uh, here's another one, Uriah, not one of the writing prophets. But there's some more, and they, those are the three charts of, of the... Uh, and he's even got on some of these foreign kings under whom these folks served, uh, like Daniel. Look at all the kings Daniel served under. Daniel was in the first group carried into captivity from Judah, carried to Babylon. He was put in the palace of the king, and so, uh, you know, he serves under a lot of kings, at least 70, or at least close to 70 years, just in captivity. And that that helps us understand how young Daniel was when he went into captivity. Uh, Here are the oral prophets. Some of these we already covered in the other section of Old Testament history, but just... uh, I just I saw this chart and thought I'd put it in here because some of these fall into this section. But Samuel, we've talked about. You know, he organized the United Kingdom. He founded a school of the prophets. In fact, you're going to read a lot about the school of the prophets um, in the rest of Old Testament history. But Samuel kind of got that thing going. It's, it's kind of, uh, it's very interesting when you study the school of the prophets. It's very much like several of our brotherhood schools of preaching where you have a small group of men, they're, they're studying the Word of God, they're, they're trying to train to help, uh, help lead people in the way that they ought to go and preach the Word of God to people. Uh, there are these schools of the prophets, and, and sometimes Elijah and Elisha will come among the schools of the prophets, and you know, it's kind of like a visiting preachers in town, and they may have a meal or something, and it's very, very interesting to study that and look at it and compare it to some of our uh, schools of preaching in the brotherhood. In fact, Amos is going to say at one point, when he goes into the northern kingdom to prophesies there, he'll say, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. He says, what he, what he means by that is, I haven't been to school. He says, I haven't been to your preacher training schools. I didn't ask for this job. I was called by revelation from God Almighty. And so he says, I'm not here trying to just get a job. Now, he's not making a knock against those men who were of the school of the prophets. He's just saying, look, I was put here by God himself. I didn't just take it upon myself to come start preaching my message to the northern kingdom. He says, I'm preaching what Jehovah has told me to preach. Uh, Nathan, of course, is an advisor to King David. Abijah uh, advises King Jeroboam for the good it does. King Jeroboam doesn't ever listen. Uh, Elijah and Elisha both will lead in the fight against the worship of Baal. You talk about a Reader's Digest version of their work. (laughs) That's it. Because, boy, they, they are busy, busy folks in the Old Testament. And, and you see the note up here, oral prophets, we call them that because they don't, they don't have a book of the Bible that they wrote necessarily. He's got Samuel listed there, but of course Samuel did write a book of the Bible. Samuel. <laughs> uh, a lot of people think, uh, believe that Samuel may very well have written the book of Judges. Uh, so, you know, a lot of folks say, well, how could Samuel have written Samuel because uh, he dies in there? Well, uh, that's... Uh, you know, it, it's possible that somebody else finished it. Maybe he started it. Maybe he did the book of Judges. Maybe he did Ruth and started.
started Samuel and, and didn't finish it. But there is some, something that we have to take into consideration, kind of like Moses. We know Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Well, what happens at the end of the book of Deuteronomy? Moses dies. So it, it may be that God had someone else, Joshua, for instance, to finish that, or it may just be that this man was inspired, and so he wrote about it. You write about your own death? Well, I mean, if you're inspired of God, you could. And it may be that uh, he wrote about that and didn't, you know, I, I don't know. There's, some people just rule that out because, well, the fellow died. Yes, in, in our day and age when there's no miraculous inspiration, then yeah, you, there's no way you could write about your death before it happens. But being inspired of God, they could. And I, I don't know if that's the way it happened or if God inspired somebody else, but uh, I, I'm just saying it could have happened. Yeah, and, and either way, it doesn't matter because it's inspired of God. That's true. Uh, we know that the, that the Scripture has stood the test of time as being inspired of God. Uh, but I, Oh, I was saying all that to say Samuel. We know Samuel actually was a writing prophet, but um, writing more history, I guess that's why he's included in this group of oral prophets. But anyway, these others didn't write an actual book of the Bible. Uh, you know, you could just about write an entire book from what Elijah and Elisha did, but their book, their acts... And their miracles and their preaching are recorded for us within Kings and, uh, and, and Chronicles for us to study. So there's what we often refer to as the oral prophets. Uh, memory verse for this period. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's a verse every child of God ought to know because that is important. When we are in Christ... Uh, old things are passed away. It's a clean slate. We're starting over. Sin, all sins are forgiven. Um, let me just pull these up real quick. And I tell you what, instead of going to the next slide, somebody tell me, antediluvian, what, what's covered? Creation to the flood. Post-diluvian, flood to call of Abraham. Patriarchal is the call of Abraham to death of Joseph. Bondage and Exodus goes from the death of Joseph to crossing the Red Sea. Uh, wilderness wandering goes from the crossing of the Red Sea to crossing the Jordan River. Marks the entrance into Canaan. Conquest and possession. Crossing the Jordan River to death of Joshua. Judges is the death of Joshua to anointing of Saul as the first king of Israel. United Kingdom is the anointing of Saul to, to the death of Solomon. Divided Kingdom is the death of Solomon to follow the Northern Kingdom. And Judah alone is follow the Northern Kingdom to follow the Southern Kingdom. When Babylon takes the Southern Kingdom into captivity. And then exile or captivity is follow the Southern Kingdom to to the, to the end of the captivity or the decree of, does everybody remember his name? King Cyrus of Persia, who allows the exiles to return home. And so restoration finally is the, the decree of King Cyrus to, to the end of whose work? Nehemiah. So we covered all that. I'm going to skip through that. All right. What do we got? Yeah, let's go ahead and start it. Uh, period number 10. Oh, I may use you now, Brother Chris. If you don't mind helping. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is Judah alone, of course. And as we just mentioned, it goes from the destruction of the northern kingdom by Assyria to the destruction of the southern kingdom by the Babylonians. And you have a note there on your handout that among God's people, of course, the northern kingdom has fallen at this time. It just leaves the southern kingdom, so we call it Judah alone. Where do we read about it in the Bible? Well, we read about it in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. 18 to 25 of 2 Kings, 29 to 36 of 2 Chronicles. Important places. What do you think is going to be important in this section? Really, just a couple of places. Jerusalem, obviously, is going to be important because that's the city that's going to fall, and when it falls, that marks the end of the southern kingdom.
Where else? Babylon. That's where they're going uh, when they get taken into captivity. Important people in this section. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, obviously is going to be very important in this time period. The last eight kings of Judah. Uh, the full list is on this slide coming up next, but you, we've actually already seen that tonight. It's the list where they're in the four columns, two columns for Israel, two columns for Judah. Hezekiah and Josiah are important people in this section, the two best kings of Judah during either time period, really. These are your two best kings. You have prophets during this time period, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Very interesting. I, we'll talk about this next week because we'll talk about, uh, assuming we get into the period of the exile next week, but it's very interesting, God's providence and how he looked after his people, even in their punishment. You know, you remember the wilderness wanderings. They were punished for their lack of faith. That's why they didn't go on into the promised land as they were supposed to. Thank you. They were being punished, but, and yet what God still did what for them in the wilderness? Manna, quail, water from the rocks. Um, their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. He, he took care of their every need. And so they were being punished. They didn't get to go to the promised land, but God still cares for his people. You know, it's kind of like our, our own children. Our children may do something and have to be punished, and as parents, we have to discipline them. But it doesn't mean I'm, I'm putting them out. You know, you, you're in trouble. You're going to sleep out in the rain tonight. Uh, you know, God still takes care of them. And, and even, you know, with us, more so, much more so than we ever could deserve. Well, so it is that even in the captivity. Daniel will go with the first group of captives. Ezekiel, remember there are three carryings away into captivity. Daniel's with the first group. Ezekiel will go with the second group. And then Jeremiah was almost taken with the third group, but he ends up not being taken. Where does Daniel end up? In Babylon, and more specifically, where does he end up? In the palace of King Nebuchadnezzar. Where does Ezekiel end up? He ends up in Babylon, and more specifically, where? What's the famous statement of Ezekiel? I sat where they sat. He ends up among the captives by the river Kibar. He's, he's there in the mass of captives in Babylon. And Jeremiah, as I mentioned, he doesn't end up getting taken with that third group. He ends up in the homeland. So God and his providence, even though they're being punished, the nation has fallen, has been utterly destroyed. You've got Daniel... And God's going to show providential favor toward Daniel and make sure Daniel's well looked after and Daniel's helping to look after the interests of the people of God through his influence in the palace. You have Ezekiel spreading the word of God, preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God among the captives. And you've got Jeremiah who's back home instructing the people in the word of God. Not that they're going to listen to him, but that's what he's doing. And so again, you see God's mercy, his grace, his providence. He, you've got this prophetic circuit in the palace, among the captives, and back home, where God's making sure they have revelation to know what he expects from them. Now, many of them don't follow it, but it's not for lack of effort on God's part. Uh, there are those kings. Again, we're, we won't go back over that, but you just see, uh, where are you at, Hezekiah? Right there. That starts the list. All these kings are this period of Old Testament history. All right, let's try to cover this slide, and then I'm going to stop there. Uh, verses and events in this section. The fall of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians. That takes place 722, 721-ish B.C. fall of the southern kingdom uh, is going to take place around 586. That's, that's the last carrying away. The, the easiest way to remember it, and believe me, I understand that there's dispute on dates, um, my solution is, if I, you know, none of these dates, nobody knows the exact date, okay? So if you can get within a couple of years of it, you're close enough. And so my, my trick to remembering these dates is to think 586, fall of Jerusalem. And then I just add 10 years. 596 was the second attack, second carrying away into captivity. And then add 10 years. 606 was the first carrying away into captivity. Of course, this being B.C., you're counting down. 606 the first, then 596. And then 586 was the last one. And 586 is when the temple fell 
And that marked the final end of the southern kingdom during this time period. So you're looking at about 136 years, uh, looking at the difference in those dates. But, but like I said, I just, I'm not going to get hung up on those dates. And some people say, oh, no, it was 585. Well, at the end of the day, nobody really knows for sure exactly what it was because it was so far, so far back and there have been so many attempts at the calendar to try to get it exactly right. If you can get it within a year or two, you're, you're doing just fine. <laughs> Great reforms were carried out during this time by Hezekiah, also by King Josiah. Uh, these are the two great, great kings of this time period. Uh, Hezekiah, again, the, um, the time when he showed off his stuff to the Babylonian ambassadors, uh, I don't know why. I don't know why he invited them into his house and really wanted to seem to brag about all that he had, uh, especially coming right on the heels of having his life spared. But for whatever reason, he did that. But again, it just shows that he was human. Josiah carried out these sweeping reforms. Josiah even went into the northern kingdom. In fact, I don't know if y'all remember or not, um, but uh, the first Sunday I was here ever, uh, I preached on uh, the lost book from Second. Second, I can't remember if I went to Second Chronicles or Second Kings, actually, which but there's parallel accounts in both of those books. But, um, you know, if you remember from that, Josiah actually goes all the way up into the northern kingdom, or what was formerly the northern kingdom. Now it was just kind of a territorial expansion of the Assyrian Empire. But he carries out his reforms all the way up into what was the northern kingdom and destroys idols. I mean, he's breaking down groves, grinding them into powder, casting them into the river. He's He's... He's killing these, these people that are bent on idol worship and trying to turn the nation into idol worshipers. I mean, he's just um, amazing. And, and they um, just, just sweeping reforms that really, I mean, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to put Hezekiah, what he did, into the background. But to me, when I read Josiah's account compared to Hezekiah, I'm even more impressed with what he did. And as a young man, I mean, this, this kid became king when he was eight years old and now he he was a if i remember correctly about 16 or so when he started his reforms but still how many 16 year olds do you know that say i'm going to turn a whole nation to god you know it's just not not common but this young man said uh, we're going to turn back to god so he carried out these sweeping reforms and just just every time you read that it's just amazing wish we had more time to talk about that second kings that's where it was Oh, okay. The Lost Book. Uh, that's, that's a great, great text. Time and again, of course, God sends prophets in this period to call Judah to repentance, but they refused time and time again. They refused to come back. Uh, let's, we're, we're just about out of time, so let's all go to Second Chronicles 36, 14 to 16. It's one of those sad passages of Old Testament history. You can almost picture Jehovah weeping as these words are penned. Who's got that? Who wants to read that nice and loud for us? God sent messengers rising up early over and over and over. Did they listen? Some did. We know it's not meant to say that every single person because we find faithful prophets during this time period. But by and large, they mocked, they scoffed, they laughed it off. They even sometimes killed the prophets of God. They didn't listen. They just made light of it. And so finally God had had enough and he sent 
Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took them into captivity. Like I said, one of those sad passages uh, in the Bible. Kind of reminds me of uh, Matthew 23, where Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hand gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. Can you imagine a, a loving mother or father that says to a child, come here and let me take care of you. I'm not talking about abusive parents. I've, I've seen situations. We had a time one, once, one year at camp where this poor little boy, he got into some trouble and he had to go home. And, and when his mom and stepdad walked in, that little boy was cowering. And uh, it just terrified me to send him home with that fella. Uh, because I just, you know, I, I told another guy, and he agreed with me. I said, something's wrong. When a kid, you know, here comes his mom and her boyfriend or stepdad. I don't know how the guy was into the picture. But this kid was terrified. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a loving parent. Says, come here, son, or come here, honey, and let me, let me hold you. Let me take care of you. And the child says, no. I don't want anything to do with you. I mean, something is wrong there. And Jesus says, that's Jerusalem with God. By and large, they're like, you know, he says, all I've ever wanted to do is help you. And what do you do? You kill the prophets? You stone them that are sent unto you? Is it any wonder that God says in 586 B.C., I can't put up with this anymore. And here comes Nebuchadnezzar, and he levels the city, and he levels the temple. So bad, so much so, that when they rebuild it several years later, the best they can do out of what they've got, the old people there do what? They cry because they remembered the glory of the, former, the, the first temple, Solomon's temple. They remember what it was like, but it was destroyed so much so there was no chance of getting that back. And even later on, Herod is going to spend a lot of money and a lot of time rebuilding the temple during the time or right up leading up to and even on into the time of Jesus Christ. And in AD 70, once again, they had rejected, rejected, rejected God's prophets. And then they rejected the prophet, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. And God said, enough is enough. And so this time he sends Titus, general of the Roman army, and he levels that city. He brings the temple, that great temple of Herod, to the ground. Not one stone left on top of another, Jesus said, and that's, that's how it went. And to this day, a person may say, you know, I'm a Jew, but they couldn't prove it. He or she could not prove it if his or her life depended on it because there are no records. They were destroyed in AD 70. That's why perhaps we look over those genealogies in Luke and, and Matthew and don't appreciate as much the importance of those to a Jew living back in that time, especially pre-AD 70, because they could have verified. In fact, if they wanted to disprove very easily, very early on, that Jesus is, oh, Jesus is not who he claims, but he's not the Christ, then all they had to do was argue with those genealogies. But you know what? They couldn't. They couldn't argue with them. You never find that argument made against Jesus being the Christ because it was indisputable. But God has, throughout history, tried and tried and tried to get his people to follow him. And he was like, like a parent, beckoning a child to come that he might help. But they rejected time and again. And that's what happens here. And it happens again later on, many years later on in history, uh, leading up to A.D. 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. And that was kind of a final end to the physical nation of Israel and God's special relationship to them. Now there is a spiritual Israel, and that, of course, is the church, the Lord's church. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, we've got to defend Israel. We've got to take up for Israel, politically speaking. You know, we've got to make sure we're on Israel's side because God's, God's on their side. God's not on Israel's side, not physical Israel. Now, you know, again, I, I appreciate what physical Israel is trying to do many times, being surrounded by Muslim countries that want to take them by force and make them be Muslim. I, I defend their right to be what they believe they should be politically all day long. I, I appreciate that. I respect that. But spiritually, we got to understand that this, this is, the, you know, there's nothing in the Bible that says we've got to support Israel. Israel of God is the church. It's spiritual. Uh, over and over again, 
in the New Testament, Paul especially. Paul really deals with this a lot, and, and that makes sense because he often refers to himself as uh, the apostle to the Gentiles. But Paul's going to say he's the Jew, not who is one outwardly, but whose circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the heart. So he talks about spiritual Israel. But God's, God's going to make a break with Israel here, but he's not done with them. He's going to bring them back from captivity, and you'll see that in the 12th period of Old Testament history. But at A.D. 70, physically, with the physical nation of Israel, God makes a final break. And now he says, in fact, that's one of the major premises of the book of Romans. You want to be in God's favor? Do you want to be God's special people? It's the church. Obey the gospel. Come to Jesus Christ. Give your life to him. Submit to his authority. And then you'll be the Israel of God. But it's not being a Jew, physically speaking. It's being a spiritual descendant of Abraham. In fact, he's going to say, Galatians 3, you're all the children of God by faith, and you're all the children of Abraham. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. And, of course, he says, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. All right, let's, uh, we'll pause there. Help me remember where we're leaving off. Sometimes I forget. I'm going to make a mark on my sheet. Sometimes my sheet mysteriously disappears, though. And then, Lord willing, we'll pick up there with Old, uh, Old Testament history, period number 10. And I think we can maybe even get into period number 11 next week. Anything else? Thank you very much.
can have your attention for several announcements before Brother Chad offers the invitation this evening. Quite a few on our sick list. Sister Aileen Brandon is home, not feeling well. Please remember Milton Wright, who's in ICU at Tanner and Carrollton. Also remember Richard and Shirley Smallwood, who are not feeling well. Shirley's been very sick and is struggling to get her strength back. Brother Ken Glover is at Cedartown, still recovering from his knee surgery. And Frida Gray is improving from the shingles. Also, please remember.